This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. And I'm Juan Gonzalez. Welcome to all of our listeners and viewers across the country and around the world. In the final debate before the Iowa caucuses, six Democratic candidates took to the stage Tuesday night in Des Moines. For the first time this election cycle, every candidate on the stage was white. Former Vice President Joe Biden, Senators Bernie Sanders, Elizabeth Warren and Amy Klobuchar, former South Bend, Indiana Mayor Pete Buttigieg and billionaire investor Tom Steyer. On Monday, New Jersey's Senator Cory Booker announced he's dropping out of the presidential race, leaving only one uh, black candidate, former Massachusetts Governor Deval Patrick. Uh, but, but Deval Patrick did not make the cut for this latest debate. Tuesday's debate marked the first time Senators Sanders and Warren openly sparred. At the end of the night, Warren refused to shake the hand of her longtime friend and colleague Sanders. The debate took place as the Senate prepares for the historic impeachment trial of President Trump. Sanders, Warren and Klobuchar are all expected to leave the campaign trail to serve as jurors in the Senate trial. On Tuesday, Senator Klobuchar called on the Senate Republican leadership to allow for witnesses at the impeachment trial. We've asked for only four people as witnesses. And if our Republican colleagues won't allow those witnesses, they may as well give the president a crown and a scepter. They may as well make him king. And last time I checked, our country was founded on this idea that we didn't want to be ruled by a king. In addition to impeachment, much of the debate focused on foreign policy. Senator Sanders warned President Trump about going to war with Iran. What we have to face as a nation is that the two great foreign policy disasters of our lifetimes were the war in Vietnam and the war in Iraq. Both of those wars were based on lies. And right now, what I fear very much is we have a president who is lying again and could drag us into a war that is even worse than the war in Iraq. You can sit first and then turn. You have a lot of time. During the, during the debate, Senator Elizabeth Warren called for the U.S. war in Afghanistan to end. On Senate Armed Services Committee, we have one general after another in Afghanistan who comes in and says, you know, we've just turned the corner and now it's all going to be different. Yeah. And then what happens? It's all the same for another year. Someone new comes in and we've just turned the corner. We've turned the corner so many times we're going in circles in these regions. <laughs> this has got to stop. But some of the other Democratic candidates disagreed with calls by Senators Warren and Sanders to bring U.S. troops home. This is debate moderator Wolf Blitzer. Just to be clear, uh, Vice President Biden, would you leave troops in the Middle East or would you pull them out? I would leave troops in the Middle East in terms of patrolling the Gulf, where we have to, where we are now, small numbers of troops. And I think it's a mistake to pull out the, straw, the small number of troops that are there now to deal with ISIS. Senator Klobuchar, what's your response? I would leave some troops there, uh, but not in the level that uh, Donald Trump is taking us right now. Right. Uh, Afghanistan, I have long wanted to bring our troops home. I would do that. Uh, some would remain for counterterrorism and training. In Syria, I would have not have removed the 150 troops from the border with Turkey. I think that was a mistake. I think it made our allies and many others much more vulnerable to ISIS. Um, and then when it comes to Iraq right now, I would leave our troops there, despite the mess that has been created by Donald Trump. Senator Warren, leave combat troops, at least some combat troops in the Middle East, or bring them home? No, I think we need to get our combat troops out. You know, we have to stop this mindset that we can do everything with combat troops. Our military is the finest military on earth, and they will take any sacrifice we ask them to take. But we should stop asking our military to solve problems that cannot be solved militarily. Senator Sanders. Wolf. In America today, our infrastructure is crumbling. Half of our people are living paycheck to paycheck. 87 million people have no health care or are uninsured, underinsured. We've got 500,000 people sleeping out on the streets tonight. The American people are sick and tired of endless spores, which have cost us trillions of dollars. Our job is to rebuild the United Nations, 
rebuild the State Department, make sure that we have the capability of bringing the world together to resolve international conflict diplomatically and stop the endless wars that we have experienced. We're gonna... We turn now to Phyllis Benes, fellow at the Institute for Policy Studies, written a number of books, including Understanding the U.S.-Iran Crisis. Phyllis, your overall response is, uh, basically, they opened up on the issue of foreign policy last night in the final debate before the Iowa caucus. Thanks, Amy. You know, I think one of the things that was important to see last night was that all of the Democratic candidates, including the right wing of the, of the group, as well as the progressives, as well as Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren, were vying with each other, essentially, to see who could be more critical of the Iraq war. They all have said that at various points, but last night it was very overt that this was a, a critical point of unity for these candidates. Now, whether that says much about the prospects for the Democratic Party is not so clear, but I thought that was a, a, an important advance that there's a recognition of where the entire base of half this country is, which is strongly against wars. And those two clips that you just used, from Elizabeth Warren and from Bernie Sanders, I think spoke to where there are those differences between the progressive side and the others, where you have, from Sanders and Warren, a clear sense that it's not only about what are we going to do specifically right now about Afghanistan? What are we going to do specifically around Iran? Those questions, they, they address those as well. But the broader questions, when, when uh, Elizabeth Warren spoke about recognizing that there are not military solutions for every problem, that's been the tendency of the Democratic Party and the Republican Party for the last 20-plus years. When Bernie Sanders said that the focus is on the cost of these wars, and it's not the right use of our money. That was important. Now, of course, in both cases, they could have gone further. They could have made a specific reference to uh, using half the military budget, for example, $350 billion, which is half the military budget, using that to pay for a Green New Deal, Medicare for All, free college education, all of the various social programs that there was debate about where's the money going to come from. All of them in the past—it's it's interesting, you know, one of the things that was not pushed by the moderators is the fact that, back in June, all of the Democratic candidates uh, who were asked the question in a, a uh, forum that was sponsored by the Poor People's Campaign were asked, would you cut the military budget, specifically? Every one of them said yes. And yet, none of the journalists are pushing them to say, OK, we've established you will cut the military budget. Let's talk specifics. How much would you cut? Would you use the, the decision about which programs to cut to, as something you would tell us now? Where would the money go? Nobody's pushing them to remind them that that was a commitment that they made. So there are some problems. But I think that it was important that we saw these very clear and strong uh, positions. Now, on the specifics, I think there were some serious limitations in two ways. On the one hand, on the specific question of withdrawing troops, everybody basically said, I would leave troops. Elizabeth Warren said, I would withdraw all the combat troops. We have to recognize combat troops are not the ones who have been killing people probably since about 2011. The killing of civilians, in particular, is being carried out by special forces, by bombing, by drones. We ha heard the same thing from various other candidates, all of whom said they would leave some behind. And the question is, when we start saying, we're going to pull out the combat troops, in a sense, that's the easier part. It's the larger numbers, in most cases. But it's not the troops that are actually carrying out the very violent activities that are continuing to kill children and women and old people in and around Afghanistan, Iran, Iraq—sorry, uh, not in Iran yet—in uh, Iraq, in Syria in Somalia and other countries, with these bombings and other special forces activities, with the assassination. That was carried out by special forces uh, with drones, not by combat troops. So withdrawing combat troops is a, an important step. It's not really enough. The and, other point that uh, I think was Phyllis. where we, we saw just one, just one other point, we saw a limitation in terms of the issue of American exceptionalism. Across the board, particularly, of course, from the more centrist candidates, but it really across the board, there was a focus on 
what's going to happen to Americans, American jobs, American soldiers. We didn't hear about human rights in the rest of the world, even on a day after a U.S. citizen had been uh, had died in custody as a political prisoner in Egypt. We didn't hear about the rights of people in these countries. And that, I think, is something that we in the social movements need to be pressing all the candidates much more firmly. And, uh, Phyllis, I wanted to ask you, in terms of the fact this was billed as uh, focusing so much on foreign policy, there were a lot of foreign policy questions that did not come up at all. Uh, Israel-Palestine uh, uh, situation, right. the uh, the attempt by the, the Trump administration at regime change in Venezuela, uh, the relations with Saudi Arabia, or even uh, policy, the Trump administration policy toward Ukraine and Russia. Right. There were huge laps, lapses. I think it was inevitable and perhaps even appropriate that the main focus was on the question of wars, the global war on terror, although that term wasn't used, because that's been the urgency of recent days and recent weeks. That's where U.S. troops are deployed and are responsible for the deaths of people around the world. That's where the vast majority of money, 53 cents out of every federal discretionary dollar, goes to the military. So, in all of those ways, it was perhaps appropriate to keep the main focus on the issues of the existing wars, but obviously leaving out the question of Israel-Palestine, policy towards, towards Russia, towards Ukraine, all of Latin America, all of Africa were left out of the debate, out of the equation. Human rights was, was left out of the equation. And that's th those are huge problems. And there's the assumption that somehow it's OK for people to be running for president as centrists or as progressives and not necessarily have to talk about that every time they talk about what it means to be the president. They talked some about what it means to be the commander in chief. They didn't talk enough about what it means to be the diplomat in chief. There were references, Bernie Sanders referenced, Elizabeth Warren referenced uh, uh, the need for more diplomacy. Others did as well. Nobody talked about the fact that Trump has left the State Department completely diminished, that massive numbers of people have left the State Department, the professionals, not the political appointees, have left the State Department. So at any point when somebody says, oh, finally, we need to get back to diplomacy, will there be any competent diplomats ready and able to carry that out? So there were huge questions that were not addressed. But I think this was a, a turning point moment in the campaign in the sense of the understanding from all the candidates that they had to take seriously the question of their position not only on the, pa the past wars, which was important, watching Biden immediately say, I was wrong, although he went on to say that he would do essentially some of the same things, but recognizing that it was also important to have positions not as specific as they should have been, not clarifying that, for example, sanctions are an act of war and not an alternative to war. Nobody called them on that. Nobody called them out on the lack of focus on international law and the role of the United Nations. Although Bernie Sanders spoke about rebuilding the United Nations, I'm not even sure that he meant to say the U.N. rather than the U.S., but he did say the U.N. Our, one of our jobs is to rebuild the U.N. That was important. But all of these things are missing, but it seems to me it was a way in, because all of the candidates referenced in different ways and with different integrity, let's say, but many reference the question of the role of movements being important. And I think that's something that we, outside of the political arena, have to take very seriously. These folks are not going to move further than we push them to move. At the end of the day, it comes back to the movements outside, not just what the candidates say on the debate stage. Very few talked about the fact that right now the Senate has in front of it a new War Powers Act uh, that would focus on Iran. Pete Buttigieg said, we need a new War Powers Act. That's wrong. But we're going to need a movement to say we need to have the end of the existing authorizations for the use of military force, not new ones, get rid of the old ones and stop authorizing illegal wars. We bring you a roundtable on the last Democratic primary debate before the first caucus, Iowa, in less than three weeks. Uh, Larry Hamm is with us, chair of the New Jersey for Bernie 2020 committee. He's chairman of the People's Organization for Progress and has just recently announced he's running against Senator Cory Booker for his New Jersey 
Jersey Senate seat. Welcome to Democracy Now! Good Larry Ham. Overall, the picture of last night's debate, uh, there were fewer people, and the complexion was much lighter. Well, yes, um, it's stating the obvious, there were no people of color there, but that doesn't mean there wasn't diversity. There was ideological diversity. And I think it's very clear at, at this point that uh, Bernie Sanders is still uh, pushing the hardest for uh, a, a program and agenda that addresses people's needs. Over and over again, he hit the issue of Medicare for all. He hit the issue of a Green New Deal. He, it, he hit the issue of ending these uh, wars uh, in Afghanistan, Iraq, uh, not going to war with Iran, and using that money for people's needs here at home, housing, education, jobs. Those are the things I think that people are talking about. Let's go to another clip of the debate. This is moderator Abby Phillips of CNN asking Senators Sanders and Warren about the controversy around whether a woman can be president. Senator Sanders, CNN reported yesterday that, and Senator Sanders, Senator Warren confirmed in a statement that in 2018, you told her that you did not believe that a woman could win the election. Why did you say that? Well, as a matter of fact, I didn't say it. Uh, and I don't want to waste a whole lot of time on this, because this is what Donald Trump and maybe some of the media want. Uh, anybody knows me knows that it's incomprehensible that I would think that a woman could not be president of the United States. Go to YouTube today. There's a video of, the, of me 30 years ago talking about how a woman could become president of the United States. In 2015, I deferred, in fact, to Senator Warren. There was a movement to draft Senator Warren to run for president. And you know what? I said, stayed back. Senator Warren decided not to run, and I did, I did run afterwards. Hillary Clinton won the popular vote by three million votes. How could anybody in a million years not believe that a woman could become president of the United States? And let me be very clear. If any of the women on this stage or any of the men on this stage win the nomination, I hope that's not the case. I hope it's me. <laughs> but if they do, I will do everything in my power to make sure that they are elected in order to defeat the most dangerous president in the history of our country. So, Senator Sanders, Senator Sanders, I do want to be clear here. You're saying that you never told Senator Warren that a woman could not win the election. That is correct. And Senator Warren? What did you think when Senator Sanders told you a woman could not win the election? I disagreed. Bernie is my friend, and I am not here to try to fight with Bernie. But look, this question about whether or not a woman can be president has been raised, and it's time for us to attack it head on. Um, and I think the best way to talk about who can win is by looking at people's winning record. So can a woman beat Donald Trump? Look at the men on this stage. Collectively, they have lost 10 elections. The only people on this stage who have won every single election that they've been in are the women, Amy so and me. So that was Senators Warren and Sanders. In addition to Larry Hamm, we're joined by Alexis Goldstein, activist and contributor to Truthout.org. She worked for seven years on Wall Street at Morgan Stanley, Merrill Lynch and Deutsche Bank. She has signed on to an open letter by prominent LGBTQ women and non-binary people supporting Elizabeth Warren. If you can comment on this latest controversy um, and what happened after the debate, but the significance of what was said there, quite stunning when C CNN's Abby Phillips, after uh, Sanders said what he had to say, refuted what he said and said to her, what do you say about him saying that a woman can't win? Well, I think this is much ado about nothing. I do think the media has latched onto this in a way that I don't think either Sanders or Warren is interested in perpetuating. I mean, Warren herself said, I I'm not here to fight with Bernie, and that's largely my reaction to this, uh, in, m in my opinion, very outsized controversy. And Larry Hamm? Yes, I think Senator Sanders explained himself well. Uh, I believe what Senator Sanders said. And um, I think I agree that I think the media wants to make a bigger issue out of this than it is. I think they would like to see the progressive camp divide, divided. And um, 
I don't think we're going to let that happen. I think if we stick to the issues, uh, Medicare for all, Green New Deal, doubling the minimum wage, defeating Trump, I think that's the path forward. Well, let's go back to Bernie Sanders in 1988. He referenced this YouTube video. Uh, this is Bernie Sanders in 1988. The real issue is not whether you're black or white, whether you're a woman or a man. In my view, a woman could be elected president of the United States. The real issue is whose side are you on? Are you on the side of workers and poor people, or are you on the side of big money and the corporations? So that was Bernie Sanders back in 1988. Um, uh, Larry Ham. Well, Bernie is consistent. I mean, uh, his positions have been consistent over the last 40 years, maybe even half century on some of the issues. And that's why I think he's the strongest candidate. He's leading in Iowa right now. And quite frankly, I don't think the debate is going to move the needle that much. I think Bernie Sanders is leading going in. And I think he's going to get stronger as we get closer to the Iowa caucus. Uh, Julian Brave Noise Cat, uh, you're a journalist who belongs uh, to the Sequipemp uh, and uh, Nation. Uh, actually, you should say it for me so that it isn't mispronounced. Vice President of Policy and Strategy at the think tank Data for Progress. What nations are you a member of? Uh, the Sequetmuch and Statliunk. Thank you so much for having me, Amy. You've actually had um, the late Art Manuel, who's also Sequetmuch, on your show before. So you wrote a whole piece on this, and but you come up with the same um, recommendation. Talk about the the debate between them, but also what you want to see moving forward. Look, I feel like we were watching the end of uh, the Lord of the Rings trilogy, and you know, Frodo and Samwise are approaching Mount Doom, and instead of like finishing the darn mission, they're fighting each other. Uh, when you know, at the end of the day, we need to we need to defeat Sauron. You know, Sauron is is right here in Washington D.C. You know, controlling the White House. Um, so I, I would tend to agree that the infighting in the progressive movement is is not helpful right now. Uh, it leaves out the bigger picture in the primary of we still have a weak front runner in Biden. Yet when the progressives are taking swipes at each other and not at him. Uh, they're only sort of cementing his position at the front of the pack. And, you know, there, um, there are some real considerations, I think, moving forward uh, once we start getting ballots about how uh, sort of the left flank of the Democratic Party should be positioning itself. If you are a voter uh, and you are not in one of the first three states, you know, I think that uh, there's still an open question as to whether you will be casting your vote for Senator Sanders or Senator Warren. Uh, and there's also uh, talk on the fringes of, of a potential contested convention. We, of course, uh, choose our Democratic nominee, not actually literally through our votes, but through uh, delegates. And there is potential, a very outside potential, uh, that uh, progressives, if we uh, pool our delegates or if we, uh, you know, stick in the race longer, uh, could use our leverage to either contest a convention or uh, to use that sort of threat of disunity at a convention, which, of course, party leadership wants to avoid at all costs, to influence the ultimate ticket and party platform on the issues that we care about, which, of course, our Medicare for all, a Green New Deal, free college, doubling the minimum wage, all of these things. Uh, I want to ask uh, Larry Hamm, uh, the, in terms of the progressive vote, uh, much has been made of the fact that uh, that Joe Biden still, according to all of the, the polls, has the uh, far greater support in the African-American community than any of the other candidates. And even then, Kamala Harris and Cory Booker, when they were in the race, this whole issue of whether the, quote, uh, the progressive community uh, is going in a different direction from the mass of African American voters. I'm wondering your take on that and uh, how that you see that shifting uh, in the coming months. I think it is going to shift. First of all, I think Bernie Sanders has support in the African American community, and he has more support than people would give him credit for. Polls show that he has support, particularly among African Americans 35 years old and younger. I think as we actually move into the primary season, as the field narrows, that more and more African Americans are going to see that Bernie Sanders is the candidate that best represents their interests. 
You decided to run against um, Senator Booker. Booker has just pulled out of the race. I don't know if it has anything to do with you <laughs> announcing right before he pulled out that you're going to be challenging him. I was him. surprised that Senator Booker pulled out before, actually, uh, the Iowa caucus. He had been saying that his strategy was similar to that of Barack Obama and that Obama was in a similar position vis-a-vis uh, -vis the polls uh, in 2008, as he was, but that after Iowa, uh, uh, the Obama campaign took off. Uh, so when Senator Booker announced uh, the other day that he was pulling out, I, I was quite surprised. I thought he was going to go through uh, to Iowa. But the fact is, he withdrew because his campaign was not getting traction. He just could not break through uh, 4 percent, 3, 4 percent, and even some places lower than that. Uh, I'm running uh, for U.S. Senate because I think we are going to need more senators in the Senate that support our progressive political agenda. When Bernie Sanders wins the Democratic primary, when he wins the nomination and when he gets to the White House, he's going to need people in the Senate that, gonna, that are going to fight as hard for his agenda as he is. And I want to be one of those senators. Well, let's turn to health care. This is uh, Pete Buttigieg uh, defending his health care plan at last night's debate. When it comes to health care, you can do it in two moves. Of course, my plan costs $1.5 trillion over a decade. No small sum, but not the 20, 30, 40 that we're hearing about from the others. All I got to do is two things. Both of them are common sense. Allow Medicare to negotiate prescription drug prices and roll back the Trump corporate tax cuts that went to corporations and the wealthy that didn't even need it. Senator Warren. So I started this by talking about 36 million Americans, including Americans with insurance, who just can't even afford to have a prescription filled. We all talk about plans, health care plans that we have, and these plans are paid for. The problem is that plans like the mayor's and like the vice president's is that they are an improvement. They are an improvement over where we are right now. But they're a small improvement. And that's why it is that they cost so much less. Because by themselves, they're not going to be enough to cover prescriptions for 36 million people people who can't afford to get them filled. Well, I'd also like to bring into our roundtable discussion Julio Ricardo Varela, the co-host of the In the Thick political podcast and founder of Latino Rebels. Uh, uh, welcome to the show, Julio. Could you talk first about this health care exchange that we just uh, played and also your take on what you thought were the, either the highlights or what was missing in uh, last night's debate? Yeah, absolutely. First of all, the biggest takeaway from this healthcare debate, even though it's been repeated so many times, is the fact that during the war talk, no one was talking about costs. Like, how are you going to pay for all this war? And how are you going to pay for anything that's going to happen in Iran? But when we got to healthcare, the questions were framed about, like, well, what are we going to do? How are we going to pay for all this? And I think that is just such a disservice to the American people and the American electorate, because in the end, let's be real. I mean, if there's anything that has a lot of universality or commonality about what is happening in the United States, it's the cost of health care. I mean, I have, a, I have a daughter who has a pre-existing condition, and it's our, biggest, it's our biggest expense in my family. And I come from a privileged, you know, background in Massachusetts. So I think the framing of the health care debate, we get it, right? It's been repeated. CNN, let's stop asking these questions because we understand what's happening. You have Sanders and Warren on the progressive side saying we got to go Medicare for all. We have to look at this a little bit more holistically. Uh, Health care is a human right for Americans. And then you have sort of the defenders of private health insurance mm. who are trying, you know, the Bidens, the Klobuchar's and the Buttigieg's of the world who are trying to kind of give you a little hybrid. I still don't know what Joe Biden's health care policy is. Um, at least I will give Buttigieg credit that he's trying, uh, playing off the Medicare for those who need it or those who want it. So I think that's a big problem. And, you know, talking to people in, 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 in the health care debate, we've already had this. This was like a repeat debate. And I just think CNN failed on this part, especially when it came to the, the contrast between the war talk that literally dominated the first half hour of the debate and the health care talk. And, now, and, and just one point, Julio, on that issue of cost of war, though they didn't talk about it, uh, the cost of war project just uh, 
estimated that the cost of the war since Afghanistan and Iraq has been, I think the number was something like $6.4 trillion. Wow. Wow. And that's and I think that's the problem. I think this whole notion, you know, I tweeted it out last night. It's like, no one's talking about paying for war. No one's I mean, I will say this. Sanders did say this cost us trillions and trillions of dollars. I sit back as an American journalist saying, if this money was diverted to the American people, and you know, we have wars based on lies, and we're and we're looking at another lie right now. Uh, the president of the United States is lying about the justification of war with Iran. I mean, anyone who is who is who has looked at this story for the last two weeks would know that. Um, can you just imagine what this American society would be if healthcare was a human right? If healthcare was something that we believed in and said this isn't matters, and it gets lost because it's become sort of this um, topic that you see progressives and moderates like fighting against each other when we all know, in fact, when any Democratic candidate fights against Donald Trump on this issue, the Democrats are going to win this issue. And if they're going to win this election, they should be saying that point every day about, you know, Trump is going to attack Obamacare, Republicans are going after your health care, and that matters. And it matters because it's a pocketbook issue for the American citizens. And not only is it a pocketbook issue, but it's also, um, you know, people want, you know, it's healthcare. It's it's a human right. But the other takeaway I would say in general, um, and I, I, I do believe, I agree with all our panelists that the issue of the Sanders-Warren uh, debate about a women president is a non-issue. Um, I find it very convenient that CNN the day before reported this story, a private meeting that reportedly was just Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren. And all of a sudden, this was the story on Monday. And guess what? What question did we hear on Tuesday? And what is everyone talking about in this debate now? I think both the candidates gave very good answers. I agree that, you know, this seems to be like progressives going after each other. And let's be real, Elizabeth Warren and Bernie Sanders are still front runners in this race and moderate Democrats still don't know what to do with it. Let me ask you about the backdrop of this debate coming as, speaking about costs, uh, you have uh, the latest news about the wall. The Trump administration planning to divert an additional $7.2 billion from the military budget for the construction of Trump's promised border wall, uh, bringing the total amount allocated to wall construction to over $18 billion, Julio. I mean, you know, we all said it. People, when he went, when Trump went down that escalator in 2016, and he said what he said, those anti-Mexican comments that really, like, just struck at the Latinx community in this country. Um, we all knew that this this campaign was based on fear and on this, uh, you know, this misperception of the other invading this country. This whole wall talk in the end is just a diversion. It has created sort of a split in this country. Um, it is based on lies and misinformation. And anyone who thinks that a wall is going to protect us, um, it, it's it, the statistics aren't there. This is not the way you approach it. But that is what the American people are led to believe. And I just find it to be insulting to to what he has done over the last couple of years. And the only way you fight you fight against this is that you challenge that propaganda, because that is what it's becoming. It has become propaganda, and, and political journalists need to do a better job in challenging what the president says. And I hope that this election cycle will begin to look into this, and we become journalists that say, you know what, this is what authoritarianism looks like. And that, I mean, I, I don't say those words lightly. You know, I am a Latin American. I am a Puerto Rican. Let's not get into the issue that no one even mentioned the earthquakes that are happening in Puerto Rico, even as a mention during climate change yesterday. And we're talking about Democrats. So there has to be a better way. I think journalists have to look at this election in a much more critical light. And that doesn't make you 
less of an American, that makes you an American journalist. We continue to bring you this roundtable discussion on uh, the last Democratic primary debate before the Iowa caucus in less than three weeks. Juan? Well, let's go to moderator Brian uh, Fannin-Steele of the uh, Des Moines Register with a question on the U.S.-Mexico-Canada agreement. Senator Sanders, you have said that new deal, the USMCA, quote, make some modest improvements, yet you're going to vote against it. Aren't modest improvements better than no improvements no, for the farmers and manufacturers who have been devastated here in Iowa? The answer is we could do much better than a Trump-led uh, trade deal. Uh, this deal, and I think the proponents of it acknowledge, will result in the continuation of the loss of hundreds of thousands of good-paying jobs as a result of outsourcing. The heart and soul of our disaster trade agreements, and I'm the guy who voted against NAFTA and against permanent normal trade relations with China, is that we have forced American workers to compete against people in Mexico, in China, elsewhere, who earn starvation wages, a dollar or two dollars an hour. Second of all, every major environmental organization has said no to this new trade agreement because it does not even have the phrase climate change in it. Senator Warren, you support the USMCA. Why is Senator Sanders wrong? I do. I wasn't here. I've been in Congress long enough to have voted against NAFTA, but I led the fight against the trade deal with Asia and the trade deal with Europe because I didn't think it was in the interests of the American people, the American workers, or environmental interests. But we have farmers here in Iowa who are hurting, and they are hurting because of Donald Trump's initiated trade wars. We have workers who are hurting because the agreements that have already been cut really don't have enforcement on workers workers' rights. This new trade deal is a modest improvement. Senator Sanders himself has said so. Uh, Julian, uh, a brave noise cat, a journalist with Data for Progress, your take on this, which was one of the clear policy differences uh, for, uh, from last night's debate between Sanders and uh, Warren. I think that this is a very concerning issue for Democrats right now. Look, uh, the president is, according to the economic indicators, going to head into the general election with a humming economy. He's going to be able to say to the public that he got the USMCA trade agreement done. This week, it looks like he's going to be able to say that he got an agreement with China done. Uh, and whether those actually make any kind of material difference for people's lives, you know, that narrative will be a powerful one for him. And the reason this is going to be such an issue for Democrats is not actually the fault of anyone on the campaign trail. It's leadership in the House. Uh, the USMCA, there was an opportunity uh, for House Democrats, of course, Democrats control the House of Representatives right now, to negotiate harder to include uh, climate and environmental goals in the USMCA. But and instead of doing that, they, uh, they allowed this trade agreement to move forward without any significant inclusion of climate targets, which set up this circumstance where you have farmers and workers on one side and environmentalists on the other. I mean, welcome to democratic politics. How often does this happen? Uh, and that forced this into the uh, campaign cycle, into the primary for for Democrats and has created it into a wedge issue. And I don't think that we really have a, a great message on it right now. Obviously, we should be addressing climate change through things like trade agreements. Uh, but we should also, as a party, not be setting uh, our leaders up for uh, a tough a tough race on the campaign trail, and that's that's what House Democrats have done with this issue. And that's why Bernie Sanders says, unlike the other candidates, he is not going to be signing off on or voting for the trade agreement. Let's turn to higher education. This is former South Bend Mayor Pete Buttigieg, who was asked why he opposes proposals for free public college. We got to be making sure that we target our tax dollars where they will make the biggest difference. And I don't think subsidizing the children of millionaires and billionaires to pay absolutely zero in tuition at public colleges is the best use of those scarce Senator taxpayer Warren. dollars. So look, 
the way I think we need to do this is we need a wealth tax in America. We need to ask people with fortunes above $50 million to pay more. And that means that the lowliest millionaire that I would tax under this wealth tax would be paying about $19 million in the first year in taxes. If he wants to send his kid to public university, then I'm okay with that. Because what we really need to talk about is the bigger economic picture here. <clears throat> we need to be willing to put a wealth tax in place, to ask those giant corporations that are not paying to pay, because that's how we build an economy and, for those who want to talk about it, bring down the national debt. So that's Elizabeth Warren and Pete Buttigieg, Alexis Goldstein, activist and contrib contributor to Truthout.org, uh, talk about this and uh, Warren yesterday laying out a plan for abolishing student debt. So I think this issue is actually one of the most important ones that the Democratic Party needs to decide on when it comes to what direction are they going to go in. We essentially have a disagreement between the progressive candidates and the moderate candidates about whether or not we want to pursue a universal benefit for higher education and make it a public good, much in the way that K-12 through education is treated as a public good. And I believe, and I think the data bears out, that when you make benefits universal, they are more resilient, they are more robust, they can withstand attacks that come from austerity, that even come from reactionaryism. Um, we see this with Medicaid and we see this with Social Security, which are incredibly popular uh, across the political spectrum and have withstood many attacks by past administrations to reform them, to privatize them, to reduce them. And so I think people also need to remember that there used to be free public college in the United States in California prior to the election of Governor Ronald Reagan. And then he essentially made that a signature issue in his campaign and really began the end to uh, free public college in California, which has sort of been reduced ever since. And there also used to be free public college in the state of New York in the CUNY system. And so this isn't a new concept for us in the United States, but it's treated as if it's something strange and something we should be skeptical of. You know, the, the mayor of South Bend has always used this as an attempt to wedge people and say, oh, well, we don't want to give this benefit to millionaires and billionaires. Millionaires and billionaires, first of all, uh, send their, their children to uh, public colleges at a much lower rate than the rest of the population. Um, you know, as someone who is, you know, I'm queer and I know that there are a lot of people who sometimes are disowned by their families. And I'm a little disappointed, frankly, to see, you know, the first, you know, openly gay major, you know, Democratic uh, primary candidate sort of ignore that simple fact that sometimes, you know, LGBTQ folks are disowned from their families. And so if you have a millionaire or billionaire who disowns their LGBTQ child, you know, they won't be able to access public college. But I think the most important point here is that we need to build programs that can resist uh, any attacks on them wherever they come from. One of the things that we saw, you know, we've seen historically, there was a 2018 study that sociologists put out that said that if white Americans see that a benefits program is going to benefit black Americans, they are less likely to approve of it and to be in favor of it. And one of the ways that you can tackle that kind of sort of racism really is with universal programs where everyone benefits and you don't have either racial resentment or class resentment. Now, I should mention that usually those, those perceptions by white Americans are completely false. There's lots of data and lots of studies that show that white Americans think that black Americans and brown Americans benefit from programs like SNAP and TANF at rates that are far lower than they do. White Americans often make up the majority of those programs. But this is a real decision point, I think, for the Democratic Party. And I think going the route of universal benefits is really the way to go. Uh, Amy, you also mentioned Warren's we plan yesterday. Seconds. Oh, about the student debt cancellation plan. That's something that would benefit the entire economy for all. If we cancel student debt, that's going to benefit everyone, and that's a real strong reason, in my opinion, to do it. There's a study that says $108 billion a year over 10 years boost to the economy if we cancel student debt we're on a wide have, scale. We're going to have to leave it there. We want to thank you, Alexis Goldstein, who writes for Truth Out. Uh, thank you so much to the Native American journalist Julian Brave Noisecat, to Larry Hamm, who's head of the Bernie Sanders uh, uh, 2020 committee in New Jersey has just announced he's running for Senate against Cory Booker. Um, Julia Ricardo Varela of Latino Rebels, thanks for joining us from Boston. And Phyllis Bennis, thanks so much for joining us as well from the Institute for Policy Studies. That does it for our broadcast. I'm Amy Goodman with Juan Gonzalez. Thanks for joining us.